Hi everyone, I'm here today and excited to talk about a book that I finished at this point a few months ago, but was actually my favorite read of the year so far, and still remains my favorite. And that book is Elif Bachman's The Idiot, not to be confused with Dostoevsky's title of the same name, although Elif Bachman clearly has read her share of Russian literature. I picked up this book as part of a little journey I was doing. I was reading the book Iron Curtain by Anne Applebaum and next Bridget Ondow, both featuring Hungary to different extents and both reviewed on this channel at some point. And I wanted to pick up a contemporary novel featuring Hungary, though this one is actually set in a more recent time, maybe sometime around 2000. Uh, so I kind of came up with this idea, which I'm still not sure whether I'm going to uh, continue with it or not. but. Uh, I'd like to read for each of the countries covered in Iron Curtain, a nonfiction history book, a classic novel from that time period, and a contemporary novel featuring the country. So part of this was inspired after I read Bridget Ondow, I was browsing other books featuring Hungary, and this one came up. Admittedly, although a big chunk of this book takes place in Hungary, and there are several prominent Hungarian characters, including the main character's love interest, the author herself isn't Hungarian, she's an American and a child of Turkish immigrants, so I'm still hoping at some point to pick up a classic novel by a Hungarian author, of which I've found quite a few promising options, actually. This book also partly caught my attention, though, because it was featured in a dedicated review from one of my favorite reviewers, Claire. Uh, her channel is linked below, and I couldn't remember exactly what her opinion was of it, but it was at least involved enough of a review that it stuck in my mind and planted the seed for me to remember it now when I saw it again. It turns out after rewatching that review that she really liked it, as did I. Now, not everyone had the same assessment, and this seems in fact to be a rather polarizing book, uh, not because of what happens in it, but because of what doesn't happen in it. It's a slow-moving book about the narrator's first year at Harvard University, and if you're looking for an intricate and complicated adventure of a novel with clear plot points and lessons learned, you might not enjoy this book so much. So I'm going to link also another review from The Bookish Land, another channel that I really enjoy and discovered from this book review, actually, which was the negative review that I found most enjoyable, and she covers some natural criticisms in a video that I also found quite entertaining. For me, though, uh, maybe I've realized that I just like this kind of weekly plotted book best because it feels more true to life and more believable to me than a book in which everything fits cleanly into a larger and more deliberate narrative. So as I already mentioned, this book focuses on Céline's first year at Harvard University. I listened to the book as narrated by the author herself, which I liked, but also the downside of consuming this book as an audiobook is that the tone the author uses to convey the characters and their personalities or moods necessarily had some influence on my own reading. That is to say, it's hard to separate the text alone and what it conveys from the additional meaning that the narrator imparts to it, and I wonder how my reaction would have been different reading it in a written form. At least one comment on the Audible page for this audiobook commented that the author narrating her own work tends to flatten the main character's personality, I would dispute that and say that this is just how Celine's personality is. We see her from a sort of post-processed stream of consciousness, suddenly humorous at times and reflective at others, but rarely intensely passionate or anything like that. So I'm not sure it would be all that different if you read the physical book. An aspect of the narration that I found more intriguing to think about is that the main character's story is clearly a reflection of the author's own first year of college, and therefore some have described this book as semi-autobiographical. Indeed, sometimes it can be a little hard for us as readers to separate the character Céline from the character Elif, who is writing, and in the case of the audiobook, also reading to us the novel. This is really interesting to think about, and I'm not sure exactly how much Céline's experiences directly portray the authors, but I do know they are quite similar, and it didn't really bother me that much. So the title is a clear allusion to Dostoevsky's classic Russian novel, The Idiot. I haven't read that, so I can't fully appreciate the connection or if there is a major one, although it is obviously intentional given that Russian and Slavic literature and culture feature heavily in this novel. If you have read both this book and Dostoevsky's book of the same name, I'm really curious what you made of this comparison, because of all the reviews I watched on YouTube, no one seemed to have actually read the Dostoevsky book. Regardless, though, I think The Idiot is an apt title because we as readers should be questioning throughout the book who is really the idiot here. It seemed clear to me within the first hour of reading the book that although we might assume that the narrator at the start of the book is the idiot, coming to learn more about herself through her college experience, 
What she really seems to be doing is challenging the idea that the university enlightens us and brings us out of our idiocy and ignorance. The beginning of this book captures quite well the way in which, as the narrator sees it, the elite university tends to sort of spoon-feed us information and ways of thinking that, although interesting and profoundly different from what we've learned already, the narrator sees as rather banal in their own way. Or maybe that's not the best way of putting it, because that implies that these things are uninteresting, but the narrator sort of tends to question the value of things that are interesting in the academic way that her professors see them, walking us through numerous anecdotes from her own courses in which something she finds inherently quite interesting, like Russian literature, is stripped of its soul by the coldly analytical approach the professors take to communicating the work's statements about the social structure of Russia at the time. And even that interpretation leaves little room for the students to actually think, since it's often clear that the professor expects a certain answer, regardless of how many valuable interpretations might exist, and the students quickly learn to cater to this expectation rather than to truly think independently. Towards the beginning of this book, we see some fantastic imagery of this when Céline and her classmates visit the Natural History Museum, and by virtue of being university students, they are allowed privileged access to the collection in back that's not currently on display. There, among other things, they see a taxidermied alligator, and they're told that when this specimen was obtained, they found its stomach full of rocks. Along with the intriguingly placed rock on the very cover of this book, the implication is that the university students, or maybe intellectual people in general, think we are being fed and nourished with knowledge and wisdom and whatever else, but really we're often just consuming a whole lot of worthless nothing. Thus, throughout the novel, we as readers will be pondering whether the narrator is becoming more or less of an idiot. In this way, it's a book that at the very, very beginning simultaneously echoes and subverts the vibe that I've seen in some memoirs I've read, like Educated by Tara Westover or Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance, one that conveys the experience of an ignorant or naive youth having her eyes opened by a college education. The narrator conveys that this is how many of the people around her see it, especially her professors, but that she doesn't see any transformation quite so profound in herself. And I realize that those other two books I just mentioned are not completely uncritical of the higher education system, but they largely present it as a more positive formative experience. And I loved how this book focuses on certain aspects of the narrator's college experience in a much more ambivalent or even critical way, sort of subverting these cliches that we might expect from a book of its type featuring a humble daughter of Turkish-American immigrants going off to the elite university. Celine is middle class, by the way, so her story isn't exactly one of rags to riches anyway, but I think the comparison still applies here. That's not to say that this presentation of the university experience is the true or the right one. I mean, I think she portrays the experience of the university pretty accurately, including many of its flaws and its little almost hypocrisies. However, my view of it might not be quite as cynical as young Céline's was. I don't even want to suggest that this is the author's view of things either, in hindsight. I got more of the impression that she was just trying to portray and recontextualize her own misconceptions and reflections at an earlier time in her own life. So to me, it just felt real and made me really reflect upon how the university and just the adult world in general shape us in ways we might not fully notice. There's another beautiful conveyance of this theme in Céline's experience in the beginner Russian class, where she's reading this novel called Nina in Siberia. Céline is impressed by how this book written for beginner Russian students is unable to really analyze at an advanced level why Ivan has gone to Siberia or explain how the main character Nina feels about it. Yet, rather than find this frustrating, she sees a certain perfection in it. And for me, it just amplified perfectly this parallel question of whether having the more complicated language that these institutions of higher learning bestow upon us truly affords us a richer understanding of the world and of human existence, or if it simply bogs us down and distracts us. Sometimes there's a certain beauty and freedom and simplicity. Language in general and its limitations in conveying what we mean is a core theme that's explored time and time again in this novel, especially later in the narrative as Céline goes to Hungary. Ironically, as the book progresses, I found that Céline's musings about language tend to veer more and more into the technical and academic, and away from the more basic questions that she might have found interesting at the beginning of her year at the university, further forcing me to question if the narrator is learning or just getting sucked into a more complicated, but not necessarily more profound way of talking about language. So communication and the lack of communication is a core theme in this book as well. It's a dynamic that's present between Céline and pretty much every other character, and I think that's also part of why I liked this book so much. The conversations and interactions between characters feel so real, since they retain the awkwardness and the ambiguity of real human conversations. 
they're not even always going anywhere at all. Sometimes people are just talking without purpose. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Céline's interactions with this senior Hungarian student, Ivan, on whom she gradually develops this huge crush. Uh, they communicate in person, but also a lot by email, and Céline spends hours and hours obsessing about what was meant in an email or whether the right thing was said, a dynamic that's even further complicated by the fact that English isn't Yvonne's first language, and Céline often finds herself not even bothering to repeat what she said because it would be too complicated to explain the intricacies, or maybe because she doesn't even know exactly why she said the word that she did. And the relationship between Céline and Yvonne is one thing that does give this book a sort of narrative tension. Yvonne is a bit of a mysterious character, both for Céline and the reader. Like most readers, I didn't really like Yvonne at first because, in a way, I think, especially being a senior at Harvard, he comes across as precisely the sort of idiot that I was wondering if Céline was becoming, one who's been fully indoctrinated into the creed of the American higher institutions for, for better and for worse. For some readers whose reviews I've read, this impression never really changes or is even challenged. They seem to despise Yvonne through and through. For me, though, I found myself in a lukewarm back-and-forth relationship with Yvonne, although not quite as intense as Céline's, because at times he can be quite genuine, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt as someone with trouble communicating his feelings and inner thoughts, while at other times he just seems like a complete fake, or, or worse, someone with little regard for the feelings of others. And I kind of suspect that this is what the author intended uh, for at least many of us, given the narrator's own fluctuating feelings about this cryptic man. Nevertheless, Céline is enraptured enough with Ivan that she's drawn to attend a summer experience of sorts in Hungary, teaching English in a rural village. For me at least, this section is the high point of Céline's idiocy, one where there will be the most disconnect between Céline's own internal priorities and the reader's perception of what's best for her. We see Céline with this frankly amazing opportunity to immerse herself in a culture with which she's at some point had a serious and genuine interest. She has this opportunity to experience Hungary firsthand from those who live the Hungarian lifestyle every day, but she basically sees these things that I would argue are the whole point of the experience as nuisances, things that are preventing her from getting away for the weekend to meet up with Ivan in Budapest. At this point, Céline has got it bad, and we as readers are past ready for her to get over it, yet we still feel for her, understanding what it's like to just be so absorbed in this seemingly important mission that she has lost the ability to question anymore whether Ivan is really worth it. I found this part of the book especially relatable as someone who was encouraged at my university to do such an experience, and I actually did in Argentina, yet I found this sort of disconnect between the opportunities of the program as stated and the realities of the program in practice. Or rather, I was really eager to immerse myself in Argentinian culture, and ultimately I did, as I lived with and participated in daily life with my host family for eight or nine weeks, but I also found myself questioning pretty often what was even the point from the university's perspective of me being there, or what was I supposed to learn from this? Months after I returned to the United States, I did finally have the perspective to reflect upon the experience, and I'm very happy with what I learned and what I got out of it in just being with and speaking my host family and the cleaning women and the small business owners and the little things like that, rather than in the more cynical sense of resume building and getting to go on an exotic vacation. But to this day, I still question whether this was more a reflection of my own priorities rather than the university's priorities, as it seems like many people who participate in similar experiences manage to do so, as many of Céline's companions and arguably even Céline herself did, as a sort of fancy vacation without really experiencing or learning much at all. That, though, is a perfect segue into the ending of this book, and even if you've made it this far without being robbed by spoilers, I'm going to discuss the ending and its meaning to me in a second, so I'll give you a chance to quit if you still want to escape. So the book ends with this scene where Céline visits the site in Turkey of a future hotel, and to me it was pretty clear exactly what's being implied in this scene. Basically, we have here what could be considered a beautiful and pristine expanse of land in its natural state, and as Céline visits it, it's basically being dredged to make way for a golf course at this upcoming hotel, one that nobody ever asked for since it's not the traditionally preferred location for a golf course anyway, yet we'll almost certainly be able to draw in the foreign tourists with some slick advertising. 
The irony of this situation does not escape Céline and forces her to question whether the pristine ground of her own mind has likewise been paved over with worthless ideas in her first year at the university, and she reflects in the very last sentence of the book, I hadn't learned a thing. This sentence appears to be quite polarizing in itself, since for many readers who didn't enjoy this book, it is the final and absolute proof that this book has been a waste of time, following a character who in their eyes is bland, uninteresting, and not even learning anything or engaging with her own experiences. But... I think a lot more lies beneath this statement than what we see if we just take it at face value and move on to the next book. First of all, do we even agree? Had Céline learned anything? I would say no and yes, because this very realization is in fact enormous, and this is the point where Céline realizes that this year has been shaping her into more and more of an idiot, and that she's been growing blinder and blinder. Yet in the realization that this is what's happening, and perhaps also that this is happening to all the people around here, whether it's Ivan, Peter, Svetlana, many of the other characters in the book, it changes the entire import of these events that were portrayed so casually and offhandedly. It suddenly makes them enormously meaningful. And that's why I just loved this ending. It suggests, too, that there is a certain detachment from the narrator's perspective at the time she is narrating these events and at the time she was experiencing them. As she narrates them, she is now seeing the folly of some of these misadventures, but that they were worthwhile and that she's learned from them in reflection. So while many people ultimately don't enjoy this book because, as Céline herself says, she hadn't learned a thing, I found this last line a real paradox, proving to the reader that the events in this narration were more profound and worthwhile in retrospect than as they were presented and perceived within the events of the book itself. Ultimately, Céline has learned from her experience, which should give us great hope as it means that we all can learn too, even from events that are long past and where we might have behaved in a way that seems embarrassing or foolish in our now more enlightened eyes. So I found the writing in this book humorous and serious at the same time, always thought-provoking and generally just a joy to read. Even many readers who didn't enjoy the overall pace or focus of the novel have admitted that they at least got a frequent chuckle out of the inner musings of Céline's mind. Now, given these several pretty overt metaphors I have mentioned in this review, you might wonder, is the writing in this book too heavy-handed? Does it force a particular interpretation of things upon you? No, it really doesn't. Even with these less subtle metaphors, which are pretty rare throughout the book in comparison with all the other ones, Bachman never really goes quite so far as to explicitly state the implied connections by having Céline reflect, the rocks in the crocodile's stomach were just like all these worthless classes I was taking. Indeed, she probably didn't even realize the parallels uh, herself at the time, and only sees the significance in retrospect. So you'll still get to draw these final connections as a reader. Now, it's still not as subtle a book as, say, Zadie Smith's Swing Time, which was so subtle that I couldn't even be sure the connections I saw were intentional, or if they were just my own interpretations. These parallels and the symbolism in The Idiot were often pretty apparent to me, but only because they fit so clearly with the overall attitude and themes of the novel. So that's all I have to say about what remains my favorite book of the year so far. If you haven't read it, hopefully this review will give you some idea of whether it's your type of novel. And if you have, leave me a comment and let me know whether you agree with me that this was such an excellent book. I know many of you won't, and that is actually great. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this or more videos about other books, not very much like this, but all of them about books in some sort or another. And until next time, bye and happy reading.